misery. And in addition, Loop runs Keep the Change, a platform that helps everyday Kiwis with financial literacy. Tonight, Luke is going to be talking with us about our economy. Are we in a recession? Are we not? And how to picture the future. Before I hand over to Luke, I just want to take the time to acknowledge the farmers down south that have been affected by the floods. Um, especially if you guys are lambing at the moment, we we'll hope you're getting the support you need and please reach out if you do need help. I also just want to note that this webinar is being recorded. So how we want to run tonight is during the evening, we want this to be an interactive session. So during Luke's presentation, if you've got any questions, please pop them in the chat. Alternatively, you can text them to me anonymously on 027 553 We also will have a bit of time at the end for question sections with Luke. And lastly, we've got the amazing Olivia Weatherburn, who's our National Extension Program Manager. She's on this call and you'll find her under Olivia Tech. So if you have any tech problems, reach out to Liv. Um, and on that note, I'll hand it over to Luke. Welcome, Luke Kumis. Hey, Minna. Thanks a lot. And good to be here uh, again. I enjoyed my time getting down to Methven uh, and speaking to some of the, the farmers down there and getting to explore your community a bit further and excited to be here tonight. Um, I want to keep it really casual tonight because through my years of accounting um, with farmers when I was in Taranaki. I think that's probably the the format that that farmers seem to resonate with the most. So I'm probably going to fire hose you with quite a bit of information tonight. But um, if you've got questions as you go, feel free to leave those in the chat and Minna can interrupt me and we can have a bit of a conversation. I've got plenty of time, so happy to stick around at the end as well. And I thought what we'd do tonight is basically just you know, with the themes of what you're already looking at and now that you're into week three, um, start to have a think about what's on the other side of these challenging financial times. Because when I started putting this together, uh, obviously I thought we were in a recession. And now last week we have this technical data that says perhaps we're not in a recession, but it still feels like that. And it certainly does for people that I'm speaking to every day, um, our clients, clients trying to sell to customers, and probably more so in the farming sector as well with what's happening for all of you. So we'll dig into that and we'll sort of try and figure out why that might be the case. Uh, but one thing that I'm quite big on is practical things to be thinking about and probing questions to get people thinking about their future. Because one of the bugbears of mine is that uh, when we go into tricky economic times, like the pandemic, for instance, it, it's very easy to ask an economist what's happening out there. Let's get an Auckland University professor um, just to pick on, on those two to start with. And you're sort of left at the end being like, OK, well, that makes sense. But now what? And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people in the financial space don't want to admit there, there isn't too much you know there isn't really like here's the six things you need to do and now you're sweet don't worry about anything it's really like being in a, a, a marathon where the headwind comes on and we've just got to go through that still aim for the finish line and just know that you know eventually that headwind will um, end up behind us at some stage and we want to make sure that we're ready for that so We'll dive into I have some slides that I've put together for you all. And just quickly, uh, if you haven't come across me before, Chartered Accountant, as Minna said, was practicing in the in Taranaki, uh, where I learned a lot and then made my way up to Auckland, eventually started my own practice. That's my business partner on the right there. We're celebrating five years of business uh, whilst recording a podcast and having a champagne in true next advisory fashion. And one of our things has been about how can we give education back to everyday business owners and outside of that you know it's all good and well to, to help the business owners but there's a lot of lessons that I get and have seen through clients successful clients um, clients who are struggling and through the study that I've done that I think everyday Kiwis could really benefit from so during COVID when I had a bit more spare time on my hands and I was locked away um, in about six square meters in my Auckland apartment I thought I would start writing content for people to learn more about tax and finances and budgeting and things like that. So I've been uh, very disciplined with that and haven't missed a Friday. I send out a lesson every Friday at 9am and I've managed to do that for, I think I worked it out the other day. It's three and three years and three months, I think it is so far. So um, there's not a world changing lesson every Friday, but 
usually there's something that sort of speaks to somebody and there's uh, an audience now of about 10,000 people who received the written version and there's also an audio version uh, with podcast interviews of different people and uh, Mikey who's a mortgage advisor and is is pretty geeky and loves his economics and figuring out when people can and can't buy houses so I dig into his brain and ask him what he's seeing out there too so that's really taken off and I think it's just part of the the landscape that we're in and the environment that we're in at the moment and obviously people are thinking about the big R word recently um, with the data suggesting that we were in a recession but now it's sort of suggesting that we're not so for some context, you know, people want to know what is the definition of a recession? And there's a number of these, but we look at it as a significant contraction in economic activity, uh, usually over a period of several months. So things are slowing down and they're not growing. Now, how we talk to clients about this is first from a technical angle of two negative quarters of growth. So basically no growth. And that's what we did see. Uh, but now that data has been revised and it's flat. So perhaps we're not in a recession technically, uh, but simply it's a slowdown. That's helpful for people to understand. Um, losing your job, your work, your contract, that can be what people see as being a recession for them. That's when they really take it seriously. Uh, but the last thing too, is we speak to clients about the fact that you can create a recession at any time in your business. And to do that, you have to surround yourself with negativity you basically have to believe that things aren't going to work for you. You have to find every reason why um, your business can't grow, why yours is different to everybody else's. And this was quite evident through COVID for us, where we would have um, clients in a certain sector and they would be doing really well. Now, we would then interview a prospective client and they'd be in a similar sector and their view of the world was completely different to the data we had from a client. And often it came down to the mindset of what they thought was happening in their industry uh, until they were challenged on, well, could you do it this way? Or what about this? And that was really insightful. So I think it's just a good thing for all of us to remember is that we could be in a recession, we can be in a boom, but unless you are thinking about these things right, you can run the risk of entering a recession at any time, no matter what's actually happening in the economy. Now, we'll just explore the current economy in New Zealand quickly. I'd imagine most people have a pretty good handle on it by now. Um, we've seen high inflation, high interest rates, house prices peaking, then declining. I'm reading today that they're increasing again. I struggle with that because I just don't understand what's changed so much to allow a number of Kiwis to go out there and buy property. Uh, because interest rates are still high, you've still got to be able to service that debt. So that's confusing, but we've seen that. There's the risk of war, which is pretty scary. A little while ago, if you talked like that, it was sort of, you know, you shouldn't be saying things like that. Um, but for a while, we've been sort of talking to some of our clients who have exposure to China um, and different parts of the world. Hey, you need to factor that in. And what are you going to do if X, Y, Z happens? So that's a real risk, I think, for, for all of us. And you can go back and you can study history. And we seem to be in this sort of perfect time where we're seeing the decline of um, the likes of America, other entities or countries trying to challenge their power. So you know, it's scary, um, but it is something that I think we all need to be mindful of because it will impact everyone. And obviously, we've seen it in, in Russia and the Ukraine as well. People are worried about money. That's bad. When they worry about money, they become less productive. They go to work thinking about money. Uh, I know this firsthand because I would do a lot of dumb shit uh, in my 20s and go to uh, work on a Monday. I mean, thinking about how I was probably going to be working till Wednesday to pay off some of the decisions that I'd made over the weekend. And unfortunately, that distracts us from our work. But this is happening at a level because of cost of living as well now, rather than just Luke making silly mis um, decisions on the weekend. But uh, people facing staffing issues, hard to find staff. Uh, just on that really interesting, a lot of talk in the media at the moment about migration that will fuel house prices. That's helped us avoid a recession because they're coming in and the economy is growing. We have clients who help fill the gap of labor uh, in construction. So they will go to the Philippines, they'll bring Filipino workers over here. And they're saying to me, mate, we, uh, you know, we don't need to bring out as many as we thought we did. The work's not there. Uh, people can get their own um, resource as well. I'm getting calls from Filipino people here 
that are working and they're saying to me, can I get 40 hours because I'm only getting 30 hours in my job that I'm here at, at the moment, but I want 30, 40, I want 50, I want 60 because they want to work, they want to earn the New Zealand dollar and they want to send it home. So often I think what's happening in the media and um, the the big words that we keep hearing like migration, it's you, well, often it's, it's, it's lagging and those things have been and gone. So we're talking to our clients around the, about the turnaround of that. And that probably started three months ago. So I do think, Migration probably peaked a little bit in that regard and then is coming back the other way. Uh, but I'm not an economic geek that's sitting on all the data that some of the banks and stuff have that they can access every week. I just go off what are our clients saying? What can I see in their profit and losses? What's happening in their business? And of course, to top it all off, we've got an election uh, coming up in uh, probably about 20 days or something. So that is such a distraction, I think, for the entire country. People will become uncertain. They save decisions until they know who's going to be in power, uh, and all those sorts of things as well. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of an ugly recipe uh, at the moment economically. But why it should feel so bizarre and weird out there for for a lot of us is that interest rates have risen so quickly, as you can see on this graph here, going right back to about 1998. Uh, we haven't seen an increase like that for some time. So we've then got to adjust to what that means for each of us individually. And obviously people have seen uh, their mortgage rates go up, borrowing on farm, borrowing for businesses, the interest rate determined by the official cash rate you know, impacts every single Kiwi uh, in some way, shape or form, but probably disproportionately business owners first and, and farmers included in that too, because you're often um, taking on the new interest rate faster than say uh, a home loan, um, a home uh, more, a borrower in the, in the home loan space. So obviously then they get preferential rates. We've seen businesses that are borrowing money for working capital, so just funds to get them through going from 5% to 12 to 16 So that cost of capital has really increased as well, and it's increased quickly. Then, of course, inflation as well, which has just rocketed up. And for some context, we have an inflation target in New Zealand of between 1% to 3%. We believe that to be sort of healthy, and we say, well, if it sits between 1% to 3%, we're pretty cool with that. Now, for the last two years and three months, so 27-ish months, and I think it'll be longer too, it's been above 3%. So no wonder it feels not right and things seem expensive. And I was actually talking to a farmer last weekend and he sort of summed it up really well to me. He said, I don't usually notice inflation and don't, you know, don't worry about it too much, but shit, it has been noticeable the last couple of years. And I think we can all feel that and that's what we're seeing in this graph where it's just rocketed up yep we're celebrating the fact that it's coming down but it's still really high and the scary thing now is oil prices are going up uh, around the world again too so that's going to flow into the cost of all sorts of things because oil uh, is needed to create so many things that we all use and transport and whatnot so that's going to be the thing to watch in that space too now this is the i guess what then happens when you raise an interest rate is that the cost of capital for all of us increases. And so then we've got to pay it to the banks because we're paying a higher amount for our mortgages and for debt. And in the June quarter, uh, over $4 billion was paid to uh, banks in a quarter in interest charge. So you can see how much that is. But if we go back to this interest rate rise here, you can see how quickly interest rates have risen but then if you look at uh, this, you can see how long it's taken for that lag. So that's why it's such a slow grind. And I explained it's a bit like a marathon at the start with the headwind. And probably even I've been surprised at how resilient the economy has been. But it just takes so long for an increasing official cash rate to really feed into the system and suck out the money and hope that the people who do have money We'll put money into a savings account and then put that into a term deposit because interest rates are higher to then earn some money as well. So we're really in the thick of it now, but the longer the interest rates stay high, I think more and more people are going to be challenged by just how sustainable their household budget is or their business budget is uh, and that sort of thing. So 
uh, not one to shy away from trying to get the answers. I was lucky enough to sit next to this man. Um, hands up in the chat there if you know who that is. Probably three years ago, people wouldn't have had a clue who that was, but I think a lot of people do these days. Uh, Adrian Orr, who I think is one of the most powerful people in New Zealand, he so sort of heads the Reserve Bank and, and is in charge effectively along with a committee of what sort of interest rate we're going to be paying. So uh, I wasn't able to squeeze too many juicy details out of him out of the on the 30-minute flight. Uh, but what we do know is that they need to get inflation back under control, and that's said to be between 1% to 3%. Uh, sustainable house prices, no one really knows what that means. Uh, unemployment at 5.5%, it's currently at 36 So we've still got a bit of wriggle room there where people – need to lose their jobs. And that's confusing. That sounds like such a bad thing to say. People need to lose their jobs. Uh, but that is sort of what they're targeting and what's predicted to happen. And that's all still to come. Uh, there's a decrease in disposable income for Kiwis because we want Kiwis, well, Adrian wants Kiwis spending less so that they save more and that they decrease um, the impact of inflation by not going out and, and spending as much. And I guess I'm slowly hearing that because... Even with a couple of my mates on the weekend, we watched the Warriors together. Instead of going out to a pub, we went round to one of my mates' places. He cooked us all dinner. We had a chat. Um, you know, listen to this three lads in Auckland. Of course, I'm so far off of Harwood now, aren't I? Talking about whether we pay for our seven dollar latte up here anymore. Gee, I feel gross even saying that to you farmers. But you know, we're talking about changing our habits based on is it really worth paying seven dollars for a coffee uh, anymore, or do you just have another one at the office, sort of thing? So that's what they're actually trying to create. They're trying to create a change in behaviour for a lot of people, and hopefully that then decreases spending and inflation gets back in tow. But it's taking some time, and obviously then we've got the media bombardment of the economy not going so well, recession, uh, all these sorts of things, and it becomes front of mind for us a lot more as well. And if we don't counter that with positivity, gratitude, looking to the future, zooming out, then we get stuck in there as well, and we start to worry. And I think a really good thing to point out, I was doing some work with a mental skills coach and he said to me once, Luke, you know, 90% um, of your thoughts are the same thoughts as yesterday and 80% of your thoughts are negative. So add that up over the course of a week. It's not good. So you have to be careful what you're thinking about, especially what's negative, because there's a high chance you're going to think about the same stuff again tomorrow. And when you start to learn little things like that, it sounds really cool and exciting, but if you can practically apply that, uh, it can be really helpful. So one of the things that I'm big on with clients is looking for opportunity, planting things around you to remind your brain to look for opportunity, looking for things you're grateful for, um, remembering to take a moment and being careful how much media and stuff you consume in a time like this, because it's very easy for them to sell clicks during an election time, during a recession, um, during economic contractions, because we all want to know what's going on, you know, and it's, it's feeding into the way our brain works. Right. A couple of conversations that are sort of very common this year that I thought you might find interesting, um, you know, leading into 2023, it was sort of, we need to find people, we need to hire more people, we need to grow. Now it's sort of Adam's leaving, don't think we'll replace them, we're just going to suck it up and do it internally. Uh, we've got work, but only through till XXX, you know, that's the date. It seems that people have got some work, but then they're not thinking about their pipeline beyond that. So we're massive on trying to get people thinking about that. Uh, we might have to sell some equipment, but we're going to wait until the day that they really need to. We've been saying, well, sell it ahead of time if you really don't need to, just so that you're beating the market to it if there ends up being an, you know, a lot of equipment being sold and then the value decreases, that sort of thing. Uh, running tight on cash, what should we do? They've seen an increase in people turning to the likes of Prosper Finance, which is a high interest bearing type of finance. So it's very costly, uh, but that's creeping in. And people need need cash to keep their business running. Cash is fuel for their business. And when the going gets tough, they'll they'll do what they can to get some of that cash in. People waiting on someone to pay. I've had clients this year who have you know, not received payment and then businesses they've done work for have gone into liquidation. So they're asking me, what happens? Do I get my money? Can I claim it from somewhere? So some business owners, especially younger ones, getting some really brutal lessons about business uh, at the moment. But you know, 
all in all, most of our clients are, are getting through quite well. There's some debt getting racked up to the IRD. Uh, often the IRD can be slow to chase debt. So it's very hard to see the cracks in a business because you can push out your debt to the IRD um, sometime. We don't suggest doing that, but that's um, you know often where debt will be hidden in a business is have they not paid their GST, their PAYE and their income tax. So clients are asking about delaying tax payments and things like that too. And that is that is possible. A couple of scary statistics for you. Recently, Zero surveyed some small business clients and one half of them basically said that they're not paying themselves anything yet or at the moment. And you know, I don't think like that's not good because when you're not paying yourself, we, we all have times where we have to cut things back and and sacrifice and whatnot. But when you're not paying yourself, you start to then wonder, you know, is it worth it? Do I put in the same amount of effort? And that's a really concerning statistic that a half of business owners aren't paying themselves. They're obviously sacrificing their salary so they can still pay their suppliers, their staff and things like that. Uh, but equally, 94% are not achieving their goals. Now, I would argue that given the work that I've done over the last seven years um, in the small business space, a lot of businesses don't actually have any goals. So if they were asked, are you achieving your goals? They would just say no anyway, because they probably don't even have any. Um, but you know, to think that 94% are responding to a survey saying, you know, we're, we're not achieving our goals, we're not getting closer to them. That's not a good you know, framework to be going into your business environment in. Um, so, you know, that's a little bit concerning. It'd be interesting to see that data change over time. But that's a bit of doom and gloom. And I thought we'd get into some perspective before we explore some other areas. But I'll just uh, pause there and just see if Minna uh, has anything that she'd like me to to run through, if there's any questions in the chat or anything. Awesome. Thanks, Luke. No questions in the chat yet, so keep those coming. But I do have a quick one for you. So what do you foresee happening in the economy from here? Well, I think that we're just going to have a slow grind. Like that's probably the analogy at the start that I've continued to use for people is in a marathon with, with a headwind and we've just got to grind it out. I think interest rates are going to be high for some time. You know, part of it as well, and it's it's not great to sort of talk like this, but we for years during the COVID response, we we gave out a lot of money. Um, and there's no such thing as a free lunch. I think we all hear that growing up. And I think we're learning what that means right now. And what that basically means is that someone eventually has to pay, and we're all collectively paying. Now, you can argue whether the response in terms of how much money was handed out was was right or it wasn't, but eventually we had to pay the price for the amount of failure that we didn't allow to happen. And again, not saying it's right or it's wrong, but I think a lot of people have forgotten that and they are, they've are they gone from COVID's really tricky because it was really unfamiliar to this economic period sucks. What's going on? Someone fix it. But I think we're really just paying the price for some of the decisions that we made around giving people access to so much credit, 0% interest for businesses, resurgent support payments, COVID support payments, um, a high trust model to, to get money. So I do think we've got to wash, we'll see all that money wash out of the economy. Um, something in the back of my mind, and I've sort of decreased this, but it's sort of coming back at the moment, just makes me think that there may be some sort of black swan type event where we wake up and you know something major's happened in America for instance or someone's defaulted on a massive amount of debt I thought we were going to see it when the banks started collapsing in America so I think that's the the bit of my brain that thinks the the like it will dramatize things and think shit something major could happen yeah. uh, but I think even if that happens I just think we'll go back to the response during COVID and it will be well Yes, we know inflation sucks, but we're going to have to print more money and we're going to have to bail people out and we're going to have to keep this, this show moving. Uh, mm. But that's going to be very tough because it will just then mean it'll be harder to get on top of inflation. So that's me purely speculating and guessing, but I've mentally set myself up to go through economically a very challenging time. Um, and if it's better than what my mind expects, well, that's just a, a bonus. Yeah, I've got got two questions sitting in the chat here. So if it's right, I might fire those away before we keep going. Um, 
One of them here says, it's hard to be positive and grateful with all the election negativity, ignoring the low interest rates we've had and, and been enjoying for so long. The thousands of lives saved by the COVID response, the generous and prompt uh, government help to farmers and orchardists over the cyclone damage and the high trust wage subsidy scheme. And I suppose, what are, what are your thoughts on that and sort of your thoughts on having a, a, a positive mindset while staying realistic there? Yeah, it's fair. Uh, I'll show you something. So I keep this. I have one of these every year. And this is a just a hardback written journal, I guess. And I try and write down three things every night or day that I'm grateful for. And I can show you page after page after page. And then I've got another one. Oh, it's underneath this computer. And I agree. Like it can be very tough, but at the start of that statement, it said in a time like this around the election sort of thing. So I guess remember that we'll zoom out of this eventually too, and we'll get out of this economic environment, we'll get out of this political environment, we'll get out of this division, I hope. Um, but the thing that I notice when I do this for myself every day, and you have to set a calendar reminder to do it to start with, because your brain won't remind you to do it, is that it's the the smile from a stranger, it's the the call from your sister um it's the 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 wind that you had it's the the sun that's the knocking off an hour early it's these tiny little things that you can actually find to be grateful for and i think the point of it is that it then helps you see the world just a little bit differently and show up a little bit differently to you as well and i appreciate you know that not everybody's going to be into that sort of stuff but it's something that you know i've done uh, for a number of years now and it's it's genuinely helped me um so if you can find a way to practice it i'd suggest adding it yeah. to your toolkit oh that's awesome i love that positivity makes such a big difference thanks luke awesome i'll let you continue on all right well with some perspective as well so uh, i know that it doesn't feel like this at the moment but we are actually in new zealand one of the richest countries in the world and people would say hang on but i think again it's just a good good reminder that a number of people in these countries they would trade places with us uh, at the click of a fingers if they could. And there was some recent data that came out from Credit Suisse. Uh, if you want to Google that, it comes out every year and it, it's a massive report and it goes through levels of wealth in different countries and different areas. It has predictions of what they see happening. It actually has data around, excuse me, how wealth inequality is actually decreasing uh, around the world, which I thought was very interesting. But there's, there's a whole webinar in that alone. But I think it's just a good reminder that as a nation, we are actually one of the richest countries um, in in the world, but it doesn't feel like that at the moment. And I'll show you why I think part of that is. And basically what I've done here is I've used the Reserve Bank of New Zealand's inflation calculator and asked it, look, if I wanted to buy $10,000 worth of stuff in 1997, what's it going to cost me in 2023? And the calculator uh, kicks back and tells me, well, Luke, it's going to cost you $18,190.39. So over 25 years, you can see that our purchasing power has, has changed by 45%. And we've had an average compound rate of inflation of 2.4%. So over 20 years, our inflation rate has been pretty close to the the top of the between the one to 3%, which we target and think that's acceptable. And basically what that means is that things are becoming more expensive and it's compounding over time. And so then we're noticing it, right? And then we went into this wave of post COVID where inflation was really high and people were sort of told it was transitory. Uh, but now they're really feeling the effects of that. But the reason I show you that is that I, you know, this is a good example of zooming out and, and realizing, well, actually for 25 years, if not 26, you know, and inflation has been at 2.4% on average, it's still going to be there on the other side of this and into the future. And if you don't understand inflation and how it works, it's again, one of those action points to write down and think, okay, I need to understand that because it's going to be here for a long time. And I want my kids to understand it as well. But people are really noticing it at the moment and and experiencing it. So I think that's what, that's my conclusion as to why does it feel like we're in a recession? I think people actually can just 
feel the impacts of inflation and it's so noticeable and then they feel like they're not getting further ahead because they're not getting the usual wins where they can stack some more into their savings account and things like that and think okay you know I'm making some progress here uh, I'm getting ahead can, so can I, I ask yeah. a question on that note because we've obviously been talking about inflation and, and state of the economy with an election coming up so soon do you think that's going to change what it looks like at the moment what are your thoughts on that, and, and what kind of impact do you think that's going to have on on a you know on a personal level for people's finances and on a business level for people's finances? Yeah, I think a couple of things. So one, like psychologically, people are looking for hope, right? Normally, and I think there's a big. I guess you just have to look at data. This isn't political. This is basically data suggests that you know there's probably going to be a change of government if there was an election tomorrow sort of thing right based on the polling that comes out and whatnot so you know a lot of people are going to be happy about that and they're going to think great we just need some change if we get some change things are going to get better and and there's also data to back that up too because i read recently that at the start of the year 20 percent of people polled thought the economy was going to get better in the next 12 months it's now 40 percent. it's a hundred percent increase in people polled so you know that's a pretty big increase of people when things haven't really changed too much inflation hasn't massively come down interest rates sure as hell haven't come down but people are thinking yeah the economy is going to get better so you know, I think that psychologically people will be holding on for some form of hope. Um, whether or not that then leads to massive changes, I don't know. Um, I guess we're going to have to see what happens when a, a government gets in, whether it's national or Labour go again. You know, what do they what do they then say, hey, the state of the their financial, you know, their books are, what can they do, what can't they do, what promises can they keep? Um, so, you know, I'm a massive advocate for trying to find wins in, in your own right. But I do think that if we have a change of government, there'll be a bit of a, a boost for people to think things could be different. But will they? Who knows? We'll have to see. Oh, no, interesting. No, thanks, Luke. No worries. All right. So what can you do? Because I'm massive on trying to bring things back to what can we all be thinking about? And to, to make this relevant to you all and back to farmers, it comes back to some basics of communication and that can be really hard to do uh, and seem a little bit oversimplistic but here's some of the things that we're reminding clients when we can and I think just as applicable for all of you you know customers may not be um, you know something you're always thinking about but asking for a deposit explaining why chasing up when people haven't paid you these are the times where you've got to get a bit tighter on that stuff and the old oh we shook hands on it it should be fine you know you might want to have the extra call and say look you know before we send the stock over or whatever it is for you gonna to have to receive the deposit or um, some form of payment because you don't want to end up like my client who did 70 grand worth of work for a residential builder installing all of the heat pumps for all of these units and then finds out well actually that business has gone into liquidation you're not going to see your 70 grand and then he's ringing me asking can I actually go and take those units out of the wall and I said I'm not a lawyer I can't give you that advice um, but do what you're going to do uh, so you know you've got to be thinking about where your money's going to come from and what your risk is that you're not going to get it you don't want to be the one that that gets burnt in that space same thing with suppliers if you can are you able to split payment over months you know ask them for different terms they're actually really good if you're proactive because most people just ignore suppliers and big suppliers and think oh i should just be able to get away with it but if you you can if you ask and actually take the time to ask whether it's splitting out payments uh, or asking for better terms you just don't know what you're going to be eligible for same thing the ird very good at the moment on the likes of payment plans, for instance, to spread out the payment of GST income tax. So speak to your accountant about those sorts of things and go on an arrangement if you need time to be able to clear that tax because the, soon, the sooner you do that, then you basically have a file note that you've been proactive. If you don't and you go past due dates and you and you bury your head in the sand, eventually you know they they get a red flag to say well we need to follow this person up and figure out what's going on so proactive in all your communication same thing with the bank can they help um, what do they need to know from you do they need your accounts when do they need that stuff are they worried ask them you know what what do you need to be seeing from us we just want to stay ahead of it and you know get into the groove of 
some of the the way they'll be thinking about their risk that they've got in terms of debt because they've lent money out. Same thing with shareholders. If you've got people that have got a shareholding in what you're doing, what do they want to know? Can you stay ahead of the communication? Remember, they're seeing all the same stuff that you are in the media and worrying about these different things. So can you tell them things to alleviate uh, their worry and get closer to them and just you know stop stop their concern that things might not be going the right way. And I think just a reminder as well, your significant other, very easy to burden all of this stuff on your own and not actually share it with other people and sort of go, I've got this one under control. Um, But time and time again, we'll see business owners struggling and never tell their partner about it. Oh, I don't share that sort of stuff with them. That's that's not fair to put that on them. But you you don't want to be carrying around the burden of all of this stuff. And you don't know, you might have a partner who wants to help with this stuff and has some ideas or they really want to know that you're struggling so then they can figure out how you can support. So don't hold that stuff back from your partner um, without having some of those conversations to see how it is that they could support you as well. Now, the other thing to be thinking about is obviously with money being tight, you know, do we need everyone that can be really hard it's a hard decision to let people go I was having a conversation with a farmer last week and they were telling me about how you know there's a season for them and when I use the word season basically the time period for them where they're saying uh, I'm not going to get a relief milker I'm just going to have to do it all myself and that's the time where I'll listen to some podcasts and do some learning and I'm going to suck it up but previously I've paid someone to do that but not this time you know I've got to preserve that money uh, in the business. Same thing with uh, repairs and maintenance. Is it necessity or doing it for the sake of it? You've got to be very deliberate with our actions and with our spending. Same thing with vehicles. Talking to a business owner today that went and brought a, you know, uh, a pretty expensive vehicle that sucked out a lot of cash out of their business. They're now saying, well, I thought that I was going to be as busy as I was when I brought this. So it was made sense to buy it. Now I don't have the working capital to carry my business on to the level that I want to. What are my options? So probably should have financed a portion of that vehicle and paid that down over a 12-month period, but didn't ask for advice at the start. Just went out there and did it, and now they're backtracking. So you know, put your hand up if you're making big-ticket ex- uh, purchases and doing things like that. You know, have a think about what advice you may need. The other thing there is how long will your cash last you? And if you're not doing some form of forecasting, There's amazing tools these days uh, that you can be using. And I'm sure your accountant will have templates that you might be able to use. But, you know, accountants can be quite good at selling people cash flow forecasts that they do and they give to you and they give to the bank. All good and well, but you want to understand it too. And you actually want to use this tool to figure out how money's coming in, when's it coming in, what does that look like, what expenses do we have going out, because it's just going to give you more awareness around your finances. And I think a lot of people, especially from my time when I was um, in Harwater, they hope that their accountant will just figure everything out and that they just delegate all of that to them. And that, you know, I think they did that and they sent a cash flow forecast to the bank. But you can learn this stuff and it's actually not that hard. It it looks like it when you look at a, a blank spreadsheet like that, But this is a tool that you need to learn to use over the course of the life that you have in business. And the more you do that, the more you'll understand money better, uh, budgets and things like that too. So if it's one of those areas that you kind of go, that's not my thing, I don't worry about that. Maybe this is the year where you go, I used to be like that, but I'm not anymore. And I want to understand this stuff. And if you talk to your accountant about it, Tell them that that's your intention. Say, I really want to understand this. You know, I don't want you just to do me a forecast and say, oh, there's some negatives down there and some positives there. Say that you want a tool that you can use going forward. What's their suggestion? Or even have a Google, ask different farmers. There will be something that you can use that you can get your head around that will help you go on a journey of understanding cash through a business because It is the most important thing in every business. It creates worry, stress, sleepless nights about when am I going to run out of money? How does it all work? Please, you know, do not forget that you can learn how to do this stuff. So talk to your accountant and talk to people and get into it. Because when you break it down, there's, there's only a few places that cash can go. And one is it's tied up in your debtors. So that means that people haven't paid you yet. 
Um, and so they owe that to you. Now you might be having to pay tax. You might have been like the client before who I said went and brought things were going well, went and brought the the big ute. And now that sucked all the cash out of the business, but they didn't know their tax obligations. So then we come along and say, hey, you've spent all of your profit on the vehicle, all good and well. That means you didn't have to take on any debt, but now you've got to pay 20, 30 grand of tax. Oh, shit. If I had to know on that, I wouldn't have paid cash for this um, for this ute. Yep, of course. So think uh, ahead of buying vehicles. When you're repaying loans as well, that can be where cash is going. And then the ugly trap of drawings, where we're drawing money out of the business as well. That's where you know money's often going and we can't, you know, we're making a profit or you know, breaking even, but there's no business, uh, no cash to in the business to show for it. It's usually tied up in those places. Now, just to expand on that further a little bit, drawings usually then ends up being into some sort of personal investment, or you may need to, to pay your own mortgage out of that or whatever debt you have personally. Uh, but debt, business debt, investing, investing into business, stock marketing, staff can be different for every business. Assets, buying assets for the future, but not buying assets for the sake of it. People think that you buy an asset and it brings your tax bill down massively. That's not entirely true. So you want to be careful just buying assets willy-nilly, especially in a time where uh, money's contracting. You want to be careful of every dollar that you're spending and be very deliberate with why, as I said before. Building a buffer of cash, this is something that we were trying to get into clients a couple of years ago and say, start building it now. Uh, it can be very challenging to do when things are tight. One of the ways that you can think about it is just taking a, a small portion every month and then moving that into a separate bank account and you can start to see that grow and you know that that's not yours and that's just there for uh, a rainy day. But I think the whole save for a rainy day type concept, that might have evaporated or gone. Uh, it seems like we borrow when it um, you know, when it rains is almost the, the way that it goes at the moment. So, you know, can you get back to the point where you build up a buffer of cash and maybe this economic contraction may be the, the thing that teaches you to do that in the future as well? Awesome. Hey, Luke, can I just jump in with some more questions from the chat here, if it's all right? Mm -hmm. So one of them is, you know, this is around the forecasting that you were talking about and the cash flow forecasting, which I, which I love. I think it's great if you can start having that vision. Um, and it's around, you know, livestock reconciliation and, and updating that and updating your inventory as part of that forecasting. How important is that? And, and can you give some tips to farmers about what that might look like practically for them? Yeah, it's been a little while since I've had to do a stock wreck and try and figure out how many, um, yeah, how how many units of stock have, have disappeared magically uh, off of the farm somehow to the freezer or wherever. But yeah, I think, like I say, your accountant or each accountant will do this stuff differently. And so, what I would suggest may not, what may just end up confusing you to what your accountant will suggest. So, you know, if you've got a good relationship with them, then see how they may suggest to do it. But again, come back to the fact that you want to understand it. Uh, the movement of stock shouldn't be as important like on paper, what stock levels you have shouldn't be as important as buying and selling because that's actually when the money moves, right? When you're selling or when you're buying and that's when it's going to come in and go out of the bank account. So yes, those journals and stock reconciliations and stuff are done to figure out the true profit of the business and therefore tax and whatnot. So they do have an implication in terms of tax to pay. Uh, but in terms of pure cash flow, it may not be, you, you may overthink it and it could be the thing that stops you from doing it when you don't necessarily need to get to that level of detail. Awesome. No, thanks. That's, that's great advice. Hey, you've also, you've talked a little bit about, you know, times are a bit tough at the moment, but we know that this isn't the first time we've been in situations like that. I'm just reflecting a bit on, you know, farming in the 80s. My parents farmed through the 80s, and I know a lot of people uh, on this call will have either farmed through the 80s or their family would have, or I know someone who has. So we've been here before. So what are your thoughts a little bit about, you know, we're, 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 this, this isn't the first time we've been here and maybe it's a bit of an advice for, you know, getting through those tough times? Well, my next slide uh, may have somebody who... <laughs> who could be very helpful. So I'll carry on and I think I'll be able to answer your question with these couple of slides. <clears throat> so awesome. I think you raised like a, a really good point. And there's somebody who <clears throat> has lived through 14 recessions. They're 93 years old. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were just 93 in August. They're worth 112 billion. That's US dollars as well. So probably looking at well over 150 billion New Zealand. 
Uh, they didn't retire at 65, so they're still working at 93. They've kept compounding, so they've kept investing, and they expect change to come. Does anybody know in the chat uh, who that may be? And let's see, surely, surely someone knows who that is. You're on mute, Minna, but can, uh, has anyone... Oh, left? here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Warren Buffett. Perfect. Uh, Mur Murdoch. Oh, we're already... There oh. you go. Someone got it first off. There we go. <laughs> and I think it's just a like a really good thing to think about when things are not going your way and a bit tricky and just, again, a bit of perspective, right? Like this bloke's gone through 14 uh, recessions Oop. and he's got that much wealth and basically 99% of his wealth earned after his 50th birthday. Uh, Einstein once said the most co powerful force in the universe is the principle of compounding. Now, compounding is not always about reinvesting your dividends. It's a, it's about layering on education on top of education, value on top of value, uh, hard times on top of hard times and banking those lessons. So the, the lesson for all of us should be, you know, zoom out, think longer term and beyond this because who's more emotionally and psychologically and experience driven equipped to deal with a recession me or warren buffett definitely warren buffett right so he somehow got him through 14 of these we're going to see more of them as well we're going to see tricky times it's just so unfamiliar at the moment because it's probably been so long since we've seen them so i think when you start to think about okay you know, this is going to happen again. What can I learn through this and what can I take with me? I need to be thinking about how I can continue to invest. And that doesn't just need to be, you know, investing in the stock market, which I think that's what people think about when they think of investing. You know, it's yourself, your knowledge, it's your business and your farm and your systems and continuing to improve those things in others, you know, in relationships with bank managers, lawyers, accountants, your neighbor, your partner, whatever, you know, relationships, because this is all the stuff that gets forgotten when things get tough. And especially this number four, your vision and your future, we contract and we're looking at the here and now. And we're not thinking, you know, into the future and thinking, right, what could this farm look like? Where am I actually going with this? Same thing for business owners. So don't forget about these things because they're major. Uh, and you get a massive unfair advantage because people forget about this stuff. And they forget that this is where their wins can come from too, which can keep you going a little bit longer. And, and they stop to do it. And then it's hard to get it going again once they're on the other side. So again, don't you know forget about your opportunities and continue to invest in those. You're here learning tonight, for instance, which is awesome. We've got the ability to do this online um, and you've got a great series that you can work through. And I'm sure the recordings are going to be there and you might hear something that you didn't hear tonight, but in six months time. So, you know, there's an availability of information like we've never seen before. And we're lucky in this country to have the access to the internet and be able to explore people's different ways of thinking. Uh, things that generate a return or compound and your farms will definitely be doing that over time as well. So you're in a beautiful vehicle to achieve this stuff, but it's just a very tough time. And it feels like we've got so many headwinds. So I'm massive on uh, on continuing to invest in oneself and even Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and, and guys like that who have all of that financial wealth all say the most important thing to do is to invest in yourself. So, you know, they've given us the answers. We just have to go through it. And a few questions that I just wanted to, to plant with you to be thinking about over the next few days um, when you're out and about you know, what's one thing you want to learn through this? Because that's a lesson that you can take through take through to the next time and maybe pass it down to the next generation. But, um, you know, on that too, there's probably people in your area or close to you that, you know, they're not the know-it-all types that are like, oh, you haven't seen anything back in my day, interest rates were this. It's like, okay, I don't need to hear that now. I need to hear how did you keep yourself calm? How did you get through this? How did you keep looking to the future? What would you do if you were me? You know, you want to be trying to having those conversations with people that have got some of that experience of going through these tricky times. Um, and then thinking as well, what's your goal for the other side of this? How will you make up for lost time after this? What business and life do you want after this? Now, those are four very challenging and thought-provoking questions you know they're not just i know the answers to those and they'll be different for every single one of us and it may require 
you to sit down with a pad and pen and just actually brainstorm what your brain gives you uh, when you think about these. But, you know, we're not going to get rewarded massively in a contracting time where there's just not heaps of money floating around. But in the future, we could be, end up back in one of those times and we want to be rewarded in that time. So these are the times that we've got to set ourselves up um, to be there and be ready for that. But also I think as well, don't compromise your values. Like I'm already seeing some business owners do some things that I think, huh, you know, you're going to regret that. You're going to regret that in two years. Um, and just they're in a desperation mode where they're having to do things that I don't think they would have done two years ago. And I don't think if we're out of this tricky economic time, uh, they'll be proud that they're doing. So be careful, you know, what you'll be remembered for in times like this as well. The big three, these are three of my favorite questions that I actually took from, uh, again, someone who's been coaching businesses in America for a long time and been through a number of recessions. And these were his three questions that he was, he always gets his clients to focus on when they're looking inward. Uh, in contracting. And one is what's the biggest dangers right now that you have to have had eliminated from a year from now. So that gets you thinking about probably your biggest worry and what the thing is that you're really concerned about. Number two, what are the biggest opportunities right now that a year from now you have to have captured? That gets your brain thinking about opportunities. What else is out there? Going back to that question earlier about how hard to be positive in an um, you know, election environment like this in a contracting economy, there's always some form of opportunity we might not be able to see it yet, but we've got to sit with ourselves and go, what is it? There, there, there's something, you know, how did Warren Buffett do it? How did he do it for so long? You know, so what opportunities can you spot and how can you grab one of them? And thirdly, what are the biggest strengths you have right now that you have to have made stronger in a year from now? So yes, you might not get paid for it right now. You might not get rewarded in the here and now, but if you can keep getting better at that, then maybe uh, you will get rewarded for that in the future. And I think someone like Stephen Donald, given that it's close to the World Cup, uh, is a good reminder of that, you know, continue to work on his kicking, ends up there winning the World Cup, and now everybody sort of knows that story, right? So what things are you good at? What are your strengths on farm, individually, in your neighborhood, in your community, whatever? You must know some things that you're good at. How can you continue to refine those? Because they could be the things that you're investing in that are compounding and you get rewarded for them in the future. So I think those seven questions there should really get you thinking. And they're not questions that you should just have the answer for. They're exercises, really. Um, but again, hopefully you write them down, take a screenshot or something, and just go away and do some thinking in that space. Just a couple of business statistics as well, because whenever I do these presentations, people are always surprised. I think that the general population or public think that business owners are killing it and they make heaps of money because this is what we hear in the media, right? You know, the big grocery stores are making lots. And so then, and, and the corporates they're creating inflation and it's profit driven and all of this stuff. And so, you know, those are the stories that most people are hearing about and they think like, Oh yeah, all business owners make heaps of money. Well, realistically, um, most of our business owners in New Zealand turn over less than a million dollars. Only 15% of businesses in New Zealand have turnover. So sales higher than a million dollars. It's very hard in New Zealand to build a business that has sales of over a million dollars. And I think that would surprise most Kiwis. And you can see on this graph here as well that once you start getting into, you know, the 1 million to the 5 million, there's another 10, effectively 11%. Um, so you're not left with many who can actually get above that $5 million mark. Same thing when you look at employees, 97% of businesses in New Zealand have less than 20 employees. 71% of businesses in New Zealand are basically themselves in some form of contracting, sole trading. Um, so we are a nation of small businesses, but we probably need to be a nation of improving this uh, 0%, if they want to, of 0% Oh, sorry, 71% of these zero employee businesses, we probably need to be doing work to help them understand how they can employ more people and do things like that if they want to, if that is their desire. So that's part of you know what drives us here at Next Advisory to try and educate business owners to go beyond what they think is capable and think bigger and think globally sometimes, but really build a business that, that they want. 
and that they set out to have when they started and wrap the education around them so that they you know don't get the speed wobbles as they go along that but it's very fun getting to see them go uh, on that journey so to wrap up because i think we might be getting close to time but some some actions for you to be thinking about very simple exercise what do you need to start doing and what do you need to stop doing if you're overwhelmed by business planning and all these types of things there's a very simple exercise remind yourself at the end of each month to think right what's going well on the farm or what's going well in life and business what do i need to start doing and doing more of and what do i need to stop doing because often we can be caught up doing things that we don't really need to be doing uh, and they are taking our energy and we could be putting that energy into the things that we could be doing um, and doing at scale or doing more of. And that's actually going to generate more return for us. Again, brains aren't amazing at remembering everything. So use your devices, use technology, set reminders and set a reminder to ask yourself, you know, what have I done to work on my business or the farm this week? You know, get it back in front of the of the brain and your eyeballs and think about what it is that you need to be doing. Um you know, that might even be thinking about how can you increase the value of the farm? That's a thing that I was thinking about for all of you. You might not feel like you're getting many wins at the moment. Can you continue to increase the value of the farm so that it's worth more in the future by doing small things around the farm in a contractionary time um, where you can create your own wins for yourself and you'll be rewarded in the future as we we're talking about before? Who, not how? So who do you need to be talking to? Is it your bank? Is it your accountant? Is it your lawyer? Is it your neighbor who's gone through six recessions? Is it a retired farmer who's sold out but farmed through whatever period? Um, is it yourself? Do you need to have a bit of a, a hard conversation with yourself and say, come on, these are the things I need to be focusing on. There's always somebody who we can be talking about. We over-index to try and figure it out and do the how, and I've got to figure it out myself, and I've got to know what to do you don't, you know, people love to help and use that to your advantage. They will be itching to help you get through a period like this. So remember, you don't have to do it all on your own. You don't have to have all of the answers. Think about who you can be speaking to as well. And remember that we are a wealthy country and that these times shall pass as well. We've just got to go through them. But that takes us to, to learn some new skills and to bank some of these lessons whilst we go through this, but to continue to think about our future um, so that we can then teach the next generation coming through or people that are going through the next contraction as well. Awesome, Luke. Oh, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I think I'll close with this remark from the chat, which says, this guy is awesome. Are you sure he's an accountant? <laughs> <laughs> I get that a little no. bit. <laughs> no thank you so much Luke thanks for sharing your time and knowledge um yeah, really really interesting yeah really excited to see what happens in the economy going forward too um yeah just so everyone knows uh this podcast will be popped up on the um, beef and lamb knowledge hub um at the end of this week also the previous webinars will be made available on the beef and lamb um knowledge hub so make sure you go and check those out um also, um, if anyone online tonight has any further questions or queries, please reach out to your extension manager. We are available and we'd love to connect with you. Um, we look forward to seeing you all back here next Monday for the fourth webinar in our series, where we'll be talking about how to maximise your farm's potential with Rob McNabb, farming through the seasons, mastering cycles with financial insights. And I just want to also note, and Liv's popped it in the chat, the Rural Support Trust offers a range of services from mental wellbeing to financial support. Um, so make sure you reach out and connect with them if you're looking for those services. Um, before everyone goes, we've just got a quick poll that Liz popped up. Um, if you could take the time to fill it in, that'd be really, really appreciated because that feedback is really useful for us. And yeah, Luke, thank you so much. It's been really insightful. No worries. I actually included a couple of extra slides that I just thought I'd pop up here and people can probably go away and explore these on their own. But they're just some little wins that people have been getting recently uh, around ways to sort of combat inflation and Oh, that pulls up. So I can't see what I've got there. I might be able to pull that down. So, um, oh, damn it. We've gone full one. So you, people can get a border, for instance. It's a little bit different. Like obviously some of these things are not going to be applicable. Um, but in a contractionary time, it's, it's always good to remember to try and get some wins. So claiming back school donations, for instance, if your kids are you know, going to school and you've got to pay a school donation, whatever donations you could be paying, uh, claiming if you've got any unclaimed money sitting in the IRD's unclaimed money register, so Googling that and having a look. Can you sell stuff around the house? Um, little things like that, they don't sound like they're major, but they can take you on a journey to then, you know, thinking differently and just getting back into control a little bit. So 
you know, I did a webinar recently where I went through a number of these things and help people see some of the ways that they could actually put some money back into their back pocket. And there's a bloke called Logan Donnelly, for instance, and he's built a guide of, he was about to have a child and he was worried about the cost of, of that. And that kicked him into action to reviewing all of his household finances. And so he did a breakdown of basically his process of how he did that and how Kiwis can save hundreds, if not thousands, from their annual expenses um, that are going out of their household budget as well. And even just little things about thinking about Christmas now and putting a little bit of money aside uh, and little things like that can be helpful just to make us feel like we're a bit more in control of our finances. So I thought I'd just throw those in there uh, for anybody that hung around. Oh, those are gold. No, thanks, Luke. That's absolutely awesome. Easy. See, the, the awkward thing for those still alive is that I can see the feedback poll. So, you know, these are... <laughs> the, 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 it wasn't helpful at all. Damn it. Okay. Yeah, good. Look, there's always work-ons, even for me, right? <laughs> so it's looking good. Now, pleasure to, uh, to join you all. And yeah, I've got a... Keen interest in the in the farming sector and keep an eye on how you're all going. It's a bit tricky when you move out of a rural area to, to up to a city. Um, in terms of Auckland, people don't obviously talk about it as much, but I know how it is how important it is the the work that you all do around the country. So always keeping an eye out how everyone's getting on. So hopefully the the worm will turn because it's certainly challenging for for a lot of the uh, farmers at the moment. No, I agree. And yeah, very interested to see how the next couple of months go. Yes. Yeah. Shall be very interesting.